Ephesians 6 and Joshua chapter 9. I'll be preaching from Joshua chapter 9 this morning, but our scripture reading will be from Ephesians 6. And the passage in Ephesians is about spiritual warfare. And we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare this morning from Joshua. So I'm going to invite Nadine Spence to come. She's going to read um, our scripture reading today. Would you stand with me one more time as she reads to us from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Have you ever been caught off guard? You've heard that saying before, I'm sure. Maybe you even kind of know what it means. But I thought, I'm going to actually look this up and see what the actual definition of caught off guard means. And according to the internet, it says to be caught off guard means to surprise someone by doing or saying something unexpected. If you think about the actual words in the phrase, to be caught off guard. Guard. If you're guarding something, it means you're alert, you're awake, you're paying attention. But to be caught off guard means that you're not alert or paying attention, at least to the particular thing that's going to happen. So it's, it's really the idea of a surprise. It can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. It can be a neutral thing. But we all know what it means to be caught off guard. And as we read from Ephesians chapter 6 this morning talking about spiritual warfare, we know that we have an enemy in this world. The Bible calls him Satan. That's actually a title that means the accuser. It's also called the devil. Now, we can't blame everything on him, but there's a lot we can blame on him. But we can know that we do have this spiritual enemy who wants to defeat us. He wants to... Um, cause as much trouble as possible because he's in rebellion against God and if we're children of God because we know Jesus Christ is our savior he can't really do anything to God so he's going to attack his children and one of the ways that Satan works is he tries to catch us off guard and I open this morning that way because that's what we're going to see in this story from Joshua we've been working our way through the book of Joshua and our sermon series is called Joshua Experiencing Victory Through Faith. And we're going to see in our story today that the enemy in the story, it's not the devil, but it's the enemy of God's people, catches Joshua the leader and the other leaders and the people of God off guard. Now, to quickly get us up to speed, we, we know that Moses, the previous leader, had died. He's the one that led God's people out of Egypt where they'd been in slavery. They'd gone into the wilderness, met with God. Because of some disobedience and rebellion and lack of faith, God's people ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But now they're ready to go into the promised land. All the people that had been disobedient and rebellious and shown the lack of faith have died off. And now their children have grown up. And they're going to trust God to go into this land that God had promised them. Moses died, Joshua became the new leader, and God, through Moses and to Moses, gives great encouragement. And they're very enc encouraged, they're very enthused, because they know that God is on their side, and God is going to help them to go into this promised land. They're going to conquer it, they're going to settle there, because this is something God had promised to their family for over 400 years. Now, I know that that raises the question, how could, why would a good and loving God 
kick out the people that were already there so his people can take their place. We dealt with that in a sermon back a while ago, so if you weren't here or you want to go back and listen to it again, go online and listen to it. It's the title, it's the message entitled Devoted to Destruction. Just real quick, in case that's still sticking in your mind, just let you know these are not innocent people that God is saying they've got to leave, they've got to be judged. These are some of the most wicked people that have ever existed on planet Earth. And so you can go back and listen to that. You'll know that that is why God brought his judgment to these people. And he uses his people to do that. And then his people are going to settle in their place. So leave that as it is. But the thing is, is that Joshua has become the leader. They're very, very encouraged. They're ready to go into the promised land. They're ready to take over. They're ready to follow God in obedience. They've made a commitment to do what God says. And for the most part, we see them walking in victory. So I said that the, the subtitle of this, of, this, of this sermon series is Joshua experiencing victory through faith. What is faith? Faith is, I believe you, God, so I'm going to do what you say. And so they've committed themselves to obey. And they've had a couple of glitches along the line, but not very many. But they've been obeying God, and God brings them victory. He takes them into the promised land in a supernatural way by, by splitting the Jordan River while it's at flood stage and allowing them to cross over on dry ground. They make a new commitment to the Lord on the other side, and then they have that first battle in Jericho. God gave them some really odd, unusual, and strange instructions on how to conquer that city, but they'd already committed. We're going to do what God says. So they carried out his strange, unusual, and odd instructions, and boom, they conquered the city. And they rejoiced. Immediately after that, they go to attack a little city called Ai, and they're defeated. Throws them for a loop. Why are we defeated? Well... They made some mistakes along the way, and it had to do with a deliberate disobedience and sin on the part of one man and his family. Well, we won't rehash that story other than to say that once Joshua and the people know what's going on, they do again exactly what God tells them to do to deal with that sin. And once that sin is dealt with, they go against Ai again, and they're totally victorious. Now that they've made that uh, initial attack and, and, and insertion into the country, they do something else that God had told them to do through Moses a long time ago. He says, once you get into the country, go to this certain place and carry out this act of commitment and surrender. And uh, again, not to repeat the whole story, but they do that. They go to this place where they're to go and they, they, they go through God's word. God's word is read and proclaimed for them and they commit themselves again to the Lord and they offer sacrifices and they basically say, okay, God, you've led us this far. The only time we had a problem is when we messed up and we're committed to you. So they're excited. They are ready. Now, with all that summed up, what do you think that they are expecting? Okay? They've had two tremendously uh, victorious battles. God has shown himself to be true to his word. He's going to keep his promises. As they follow his instructions, he's going to do what he said and give them victory. So as they look at the rest of the country that they have to go out and they have to conquer, it's just a bunch of little city-states and they have to conquer these. What do you think they might expect? Well, as we look at what's happened already, they might expect that perhaps some of the cities will um, barricade themselves in. That's what Jericho did. They were so afraid of what was going to happen because they'd already heard the rumors of what God had done for this people for the last 40 years, and especially over the last couple of months, they had probably seen the Jordan River dry up and let them walk across, and so Jericho barricaded themselves in. So Joshua and the leaders might possibly be thinking, okay, there may be some cities that we've got to go and, and battle against, and they'll just barricade themselves in, and God will give us victory that way. They might also think that some of them might do what Ai did. They didn't barricade themselves in. When Joshua and the people attacked, they attacked back. So they may be anticipating that as they approach and go to these various cities, that there may be some that won't barricade themselves in, but they might actually come out and engage them in battle, and they're going to have to fight. But again, the confidence that if they do what God tells them to do, that they'll have the victory. But something they probably weren't expecting was some form of deception. They weren't expecting it. But that is exa exactly what happens in this chapter. And that's why we find, I think, that Joshua and the leaders and the people are caught off guard. Can I tell you that that's the same picture that we see in our own lives and in our walk with the Lord as we seek to live for God, as we have a relationship with Him. Satan loves to attack us. 
But if he can't defeat us by an outright, you know, in-your-face attack, he will try to catch us off guard and trip us up with deceit. The title of the message today is Deceived by the Enemy. Deceived by the Enemy. The problem that Joshua and the people are going to face in this chapter is not some big battle or a city that has locked themselves up and God's got to bring victory somehow. But instead, the enemy trying to and actually succeeding in deceiving them. Now, as we go through this chapter, we're going to see several principles about spiritual warfare and and, and the process of making decisions in our life. You say, well, what's the relationship between spiritual warfare and decisions? Well, when you're talking about how the enemy comes to deceive us, he often does that in the context of decisions that we make. He wants us to make the wrong decisions. Decisions that will lead us away from God Decisions that uh, on the surface may look good But they're going to lead us into sin Decisions that are going to lead us into a place Where he can be more successful at attacking us And so the decisions that we make And how we go about making those decisions Have a lot to do with spiritual warfare And whether we're going to be victorious In that spiritual warfare or not So it's going to be kind of tied together Spiritual warfare and making decisions So let's take a look at this story little by little And the principles that are there And the first principle is this Opposition often increases after victory Opposition often increases after victory Now it sounds kind of illogical It sounds kind of unusual But I know that many of you have experienced this Just as I have That many times the enemy comes after us stronger Or in an unexpected way After we've had a wonderful time Now I don't mean we've had a wonderful time Because we had a great birthday party or something like that I'm talking about a wonderful time with the Lord You know we had a difficulty We had a battle We had a need We had something that was going on And we prayed and God came through And he met the need And he took care of us And we're excited Or maybe we had um, something else going on in our life And we have an encounter with God Either privately or in a service or something And God just comes and moves in our midst And we just feel like God is here And I've had that You know we often call like a mountaintop experience Or maybe we go off to a conference Or or a convention or a retreat and get away and spend that time with God and he does something neat and it's like yay this is a great time can I tell you that after times like that the enemy isn't necessarily just going back off and leave you alone he's going to double down he's going to he's going to fight even harder opposition often increases after victory we see that in this story As I said, they had these two tremendous victories over Jericho and over Ai. And let's read verses 1 through 6 of Joshua chapter 9. It says, As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Termites, oh no, there's no termites in there, and the Jebusites heard of this. All these kings heard of this. What did they hear of? Well, we know from other things that have been said, they, they've already heard what God did 40 years ago, releasing these people from Egypt and splitting the Red Sea. We know they've also heard about how God just a couple months ago defeated some enemies on the other side of the Jordan before they even get into the Promised Land. But they heard about the most recent events. They heard about the defeat of Jericho. They possibly heard about Israel's defeat at the hands of Ai, but they've also heard that Israel turned around and defeated Ai. Well, it says, when they heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon, this is a city, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out, worn out sacks from their donkeys and wineskins Worn out and torn and mended With worn out patched sandals on their feet And worn out clothes And all their provisions were dry and crumbly And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal And said to him and to the men of Israel We have come from a far distant country So now make a covenant with us Make a treaty with us Make an agreement with us So we see Joshua and the Israelites had just experienced these victories in battle. They just had this mountaintop experience of meeting with God, interacting with his word, worshiping him, recommitting themselves to God. And God's like, I'm on your side. I'm going to bless you as a result of this. And immediately the the enemies are gathering 
for an attack. It, it, it seems to indicate that the kings of these cities gathered together. Uh, in that time, you know, there was not one united nation of Canaanites, okay? It's these people groups, and they were clustered in cities, and each city was like a sovereign um, entity of itself, and there was a king over each city, and they often fought with each other, but when they had a common enemy come from the outside, they would join together to stand against that common enemy, and that's exactly what they're doing here. Joshua is leading God's people into the land, and they've heard about it, and they know they're, 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 they're in danger, so they gather together, and they say, what are we going to do? And they say, we are going to conquer them. Perhaps they, 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 they heard all these rumors, they'd heard all these stories of what this God had done for his people, but maybe they gained a little bit of hope because there was that one time that they lost you know the first time they attacked AI and so they decided we're going to all join together we're going to fight against Joshua but whether the people of Gideon whether there were representatives of the city of Gibeon there or not for some reason Gibeon didn't have a king I don't know if they had a different type of government you know some kind of democracy or republic or whatever with a ruling council but they didn't have a king whether or not they did or not they may have sent some representatives to this council and they hear these plans or maybe they didn't even send somebody but they make a decision we're not going to go that direction it's going to come out later in the story they've heard these same stories and they see that this god is powerful and they know that their lives are in great danger and there's a much greater possibility that they're going to be destroyed than that they can have victory and they decide that they're not going to fight they're going to cunningly deceive the people and somehow try to survive that way. Now, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but going back to this point here, opposition often increases after victory. We see that Joshua and the people have had these victories, but now the enemy, they're gathering together. There are some that are planning an out-and-out obvious opposition because they're going to fight they're going to attack them and that eventually does happen in chapter 10 and, and god brings victory to his people but then there's another aspect of the enemy that decides to try to gain some kind of quote victory through deception can i tell you that that's exactly the way the devil wants to work in our lives that's exactly when the devil wants to work in our lives. After a victory is a prime time for him to attack. What makes that such a good time for him to attack? Well, I think that after a victory, we're not necessarily expecting an attack so quickly. Unless we've been through it enough times and we've grown enough and we've experienced it enough. It's like, okay, it's great what God has just done, but I got to pay attention. I got to stay on guard. I got to keep an eye out. I've got to keep myself on my toes because the, the enemy is going to be coming back after me again. But unless we've learned that, we may not expect it. It's an easy time for us to let down our guard. We feel good. We feel strong because we've just come out of a victory. Sometimes when that happens, we have a tendency to try to rely on our own strength. That's kind of what happened at Jericho. You know, they had that great victory at Jericho. And the people seem to be kind of filled with a little bit of pride. I mean, God's the one that did it, but the people are so, and they kind of get full of self-confidence and, and pride and um, attack AI without consulting God, and they're defeated. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be so. But here's the principle here. When we actively seek to do right, the enemy actively seeks to defeat us. That's just a fact of life. That's just a fact of being in relationship with God and trying to live for Him. Whenever we actively seek to do what's right, to live for God, the enemy is actively going to seek to defeat us. Now, that might raise the question, then why should we do it? It's like, if the enemy is going to attack me, if I'm trying to do the right thing, maybe it's not such a good thing to do the right thing. Well, let me just tell you this, that if we don't actively seek to do what's right, we're already defeated. In other words, the end result is going to be the same. Probably, and definitely, eternally speaking, it's going to be even worse. You see, if we choose to give up on our relationship with God, we choose to give up on trying to do what God wants us to do and live in good relationship with Him and become those people He calls us to be, realizing that the sin that we get caught in or we were caught in and, we, and the devil wants us to draw us back into is what destroys our lives. If we just say, forget it, I'm not even going to try anymore, we get involved even more deeply in those things that draw us away from God and destroy us and as we sang in our song this morning we get broke we get in bondage it's like we have chains wrapped around us and that's a definite thing 
But if we choose to say, God, I'm in relationship with you. I thank you that you have set me free from the bondage of sin and death. And yes, I've got an enemy. He's going to come against me, but I believe you can bring victory to me. So I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do what is right. I want to be in right relationship with you. Yes, that will cause the enemy to want to attack us even more strongly. But can I tell you that the other side of it is that's when you're the strongest. And that's when you are most likely to be able to continue to walk in victory if you don't let down your guard, if you don't get caught off guard, okay? Maybe that particular point was what some of you this morning specifically needed to hear because you've been going through some tough stuff. You've been trying to live for God and one thing after another keeps coming your way. You're trying to do the right thing and God brings victory and the enemy keeps fighting and you're feeling like, why should I keep trying? If that's you, here's the main thing God wants you to hear. Don't give up. God's brought you through victory again. He will continue to bring you through victory as you walk with him and depend on him and stay on your guard. So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to be on guard for obvious, obvious opposition. Now, this is pretty easy. You know, we're walking along trying to live for God, and then something just pops up in our face, and we know it's the enemy trying to yank our chain, trip us up, causes problems but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention we need to pay attention for that it's interesting in first peter 5 8 uh satan is described like a devouring lion all right well those were more those are more obvious those we're more awake to those we notice a lot easier but the second thing is is we need to be on guard for deceptive opposition not just the obvious but the deceptive opposition those ways that the enemy will try to slip in under the radar those ways in which he will try to slip in in a way or from a direction we would never anticipate and even seem to be a good thing or a right thing to trip us up through deception i mentioned first peter 5 8 talks about satan being a devouring lion second corinthians eleven three 3 uh, paints a picture of him as a deceiving serpent and we see that going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know, when Satan first entered the picture with Adam and Eve, he didn't come with some major in-their-face opposition. The very first attack upon human beings by the enemy was a deceptive attack. He was successful in that one too. So opposition often increases after victory. We need to pay attention to that. The second thing we're going to see from this story, uh, don't make decisions based on appearances alone. Don't make decisions based on appearances alone. Let's look at uh, verses 6 through 15. I concluded with 6. We'll repeat that one there. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. Make an agreement with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us then how can we make a covenant with you? See, they're suspicious. These people show up out of nowhere and they're suspicious. They're asking the right questions at the beginning. Verse eight, they said to Joshua, we're your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here's our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now it's dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them and behold, they burst. And these garments and sandals of ours were, are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. When it says they swore to, it doesn't mean they swore at them. They swore an oath to have a relationship, to have a covenant with them. So we see the deceptive tactic that the people from Gibeon used. We're going to find out in just a moment that their city is just three days travel from um, where they're at. And it's not just one city, it's one major city with three little cities that are kind of associated with it. And, and the Bible says in chapter 10 that these are a very strong and courageous people. These are, these are not cowards. 
These are not weak people. These, this is not just some little city saying, well, we can't survive on our own, so we're gonna... This is people that are strong and courageous, but they still recognize that this God of this nation that is coming in is going to defeat them, and so they decide to see them. They, they hid their true identity. Again, being only three days journey away, and they put on old clothes and, and dry crusty moldy bread and and burst old wineskins and present themselves as that all this was fresh and new when they left home they've traveled so far for so long that all this stuff is worn out gone bad disintegrated so they played on their sympathies as weary travelers they even played on their ego we've heard about your god and we want to have a relationship with you why'd they do this because they were afraid They were afraid. They figured it was better to give in than fight, but they also were concerned about the consequences of surrender. You see, they could have just surrendered. They could have come, told the truth, and said, we surrender. Now, I would just say that from our perspective, we could look at that and say, that would have been a much better choice because we see that when people surrendered to God, we have the illustration of Rahab in Jericho and basically says, hey, we're surrendering to you and your God. We see that your God is the God and and we want to serve you and serve him and that God had mercy and had grace. But they didn't know that. And so they were afraid if they surrendered that perhaps they might just totally annihilate them without a battle. So they decided to go with deception. Let's bring that back to today in our own lives. And and, and a point that I've been emphasizing all along, Satan loves to deceive God's people. I mean, he loves to attack them in the obvious ways, but apart from that, he loves to deceive them. We see in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Paul says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. In other words, Satan doesn't just pop up in front of us with the caricature that we have in society that doesn't come from the Bible of the, of the red suit with the pointy horns and the pointy tail and the pitchfork saying, here I am, the devil, I'm going to destroy you. Okay? He comes to us in some positive way, some good way, some, some way that looks appealing. He loves deception. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't put it in my notes here, the exact reference that, Jesus, that Satan is the, a liar and the father of lies loves to deceive and we see as I mentioned before that that's how he got a foothold and got things started with Eve in the Garden of Eden but you know each and every one of us can probably give uh, examples out of our own life times when the enemy just did a full out frontal attack and we recognized it and whether we fell to it or fought against it whatever but then there are other times that we're just going on in life trying to live for God and something slips in and he deceived us he deceived us he deceived us because that's the way he works. But the other reason that we don't need to make decisions based on appearances alone is that we cannot always depend on just what we see. And that's true even apart from spiritual things. That's true even apart from God and our enemy, the devil. You know, there are things that we see, and and talking specifically about seeing with our eyes, but things that we experience, we hear about, whatever, that we get one idea, and then when we learn the whole truth, we realize, oh, that wasn't the way it appeared. I mean, hasn't that happened to you all the time? I mean, I hate it when that happens to me. When I do or say something, somebody only, only hears part of it or part of the context, and they draw some conclusions that aren't at all true, you know? But it's especially true in spiritual warfare. We cannot depend on just what we see proverbs 14 12 says there's a way that appears to be right but in the end it leads to death we can't just always trust our senses paul put it in a positive way in second corinthians 5 7 he says we live by faith not by sight we live by faith not by sight now, that sounds really spiritual how many of you have heard that statement before Yeah, probably we've all used it. Do you know what that really means? We live by faith, not by sight. What does that actually mean? I came across this definition. I like this. It says, to walk in a spirit of prayerful dependence on the Lord and his guidance. In other words, we're trusting in what God says about a situation rather than just, and I I put that word just in there on purpose, just what we perceive about that situation. Okay? Okay. 
In other words, we're looking, we're asking God, and we're, we're listening to God, and we're considering what God has to say about something that perhaps we've experienced or we've heard or we've seen, or we're, we're, we're looking at making a decision, and we're not just going by our own perceptions only, alone. But by faith, we're going to say, God, what do you have to say about this? In other words, we're going to trust what God says rather than what we see. Now, does this mean we can't trust, trust our senses? No, that's not true at all. That's why I keep using the word just or alone. We don't trust our senses alone. We don't make decisions based on what we see or hear or listen to um, alone. God wants us to use our senses. He gave them to us. That's how we live, okay? But we've got to realize that there's so much more that is there than what we just perceive, it's one of the reasons, not even the most important one, but one of the major reasons we need the Lord and his work in our life because we're going to face so many things that we don't expect, so many things like we started out with that are going to catch us off guard, so many things that we don't know enough about to make the best, to make the right decision. So we need the Lord. It just means that we can't or we shouldn't trust our senses alone. And that leads us into the third principle here that, that we really need to apply, and, and hopefully you already are. But consult God about everything of significance. Consult God about everything of significance. Now, when I first worked out this sermon and made up my points, I just put consult God about everything. And as I was meditating on that yesterday, I thought, I gotta change that. Because most people would understand what I mean by that, but some would say, okay, that means I gotta ask God what clothes I should wear today. Oh, that means I got to ask God about what I should eat for breakfast and whether I should have one eggs or one egg or two eggs or th- you know I mean I I don't mean literally that we've got to go to God with every little t- you know you make thousands of decisions a minute you're not even aware of it you know you're looking you're all kinds of you know and we there's no possible way we can ask God about everything but it only makes sense that we would consult God about everything of significance now that raises another question how do we know if it's significant well if you have any doubt treat it as if it is. Okay, if you're facing a decision, if you're facing a situation and you want to know the right thing to do, you want to know how to handle it, you don't want to be deceived by the enemy, and it's like, well, is this something that's significant or not? If you're not sure, ask God. God loves us enough, he'll guide us and he'll lead us, he'll let us know, okay? So consult God about everything of significance. See, this is where the problem was. Let's look back at verses 14 through 16. It says here, so the men took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel from the Lord. In other words, Joshua and the leaders are talking to them. At first, they are suspicious. They're asking questions, good questions. But then the men respond with their deceit, with their deception. And they, 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 it says they took some of their provisions. They're, they're, you know, they see the clothes. They see the wineskins. And they actually take some of the, bri- the bread. The, the, you know, it's all dried, falling apart. They, they took some of it. I don't know if that means they took it and they tasted it or they just saw that it's old. So in other they're putting their trust. They're putting their... Um, the basis of their decision on what they can see, what they can feel, what they can experience. But then it says, but they didn't ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. And at the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. So they were taken in. They trusted only what they saw, only what they heard, only what was presented to them. They didn't consult the Lord. See, that's where the problem was. It says they did not ask counsel from the Lord. Some translators say they did not inquire of the Lord. You know what this tells us? We need to consult God about everything of significance, even if the answer seems obvious. Now, again, I'm not talking about little things that God doesn't care about, like what you have for breakfast. And I mean, unless he's dealt with your heart about you need to eat more healthy and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the things that are really significant in our lives. Even if the answer seems obvious, we need to consult with God. You know, that's part of what caused the problem with their defeat at Ai. They came out of the victory of Jericho assuming everything was fine. We, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we, when we dealt with that passage of Scripture. 
that out of that in their confidence, whether it's self-confidence and pride or just confidence in God, they say, oh, let's just send a small army up to Ai. It's a real small town. The spies came back and said, you don't need much. They said, and they're defeated. And part of the problem was that they didn't ask God what he wanted them to do. There was a problem. There was sin in the camp. Someone had deliberately, rebelliously uh, defied God's commands, and it caused them to be underneath God's judgment, and they didn't even realize it. We see that up to that point, and after this, Joshua is constantly communicating with God. I think he finally learned his lesson. Consult with the Lord. Consult God about everything of significance. They listened to the enemy's, these people from giving, they listened to the enemy's explanations, but they didn't talk to God about it even though they were originally suspicious. I'll tell you something, it is easy to fall into the habit of acting without praying. Of just going through life. And it's easiest for that to happen to people who really have a desire to live for God and are really trying to do the right thing because as we walk along with God and we're trying to do the right thing and live the right way and we're spending time with God, it's easy to approach new situations feeling like, well, I'm walking with God and everything's good and we just make decisions without thinking a whole lot about it and without consulting God about it. Can I tell you that that is a real danger for me as a pastor? You know, uh, serving as a pastor and I spend time studying God's word all the time for my own personal devotions, but also for Bible studies and that kind of stuff. And, and, and I've got some wonderful godly counselors around me, our elders and our deacons and deaconesses and, and other saints that may not hold those positions, but they, they're wise men and women and, 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 you know, that I can go to and who, who have the freedom to speak and, and, and talk to me. And that, all that, it's so easy. It would be so easy to just kind of go through through ministry to go through life myself as a pastor and do things just by doing what seems normal what seems natural what seems most logical without really seeking God and I have learned you need to seek God about the things that even seem so the most logical thing let me just give you a real simple example okay um, we're going to have a deacon meeting this afternoon at 4 30 our deacons and deaconesses meet together we got the elder board the deacon board the elders handle all the spiritual leadership issues the deacons and deaconesses handle all the physical uh, financial issues and we meet every two months the elders meet every month but we got a meeting this afternoon and I've got my agenda all lined out and I know we're gonna have a good discussion about the things we gotta do. We'll make some good decisions. We'll go home satisfied. God's helping us. God's leading us. I don't anticipate any kind of problems. I never anticipate any kind of problems in our elders and deacons meetings because God has so blessed us to walk in unity. But can I tell you, I've learned not to just assume that's so. You know, I've got the meeting this afternoon. I've been praying about it all this. Now, I don't mean that I've been spending hours in prayer, but I've been praying about it this week. I've even said to the Lord some things like, well, Lord, we got our deacons meeting this Sunday night, and I got the agenda, everything. You know, we, we'll have good discussions. We'll have some, make some good decisions. But, Lord, I don't know what all we are going to face together. So even now I'm asking you to guide and lead me as I prepare for this meeting and our, and our men and women, and I pray we'd have a really good meeting. In fact, just this morning, my wife and I were praying before I walked out the door. We try to do that every morning and just praying for the day, praying for the service. And I said, Lord, help us to have a good deacon meeting and, and have a, you know, make good decisions and guide us and lead us because I've learned don't just assume. Don't just take for granted we have such a wonderful group of elders, but I pray before every elder meeting, never anticipating any kind of problems. But I say, God, guide us and lead us and help us because I know the enemy would love to get in there and not only deceive me, but deceive us as a group. Another thing he loves to do that um, we see a little bit of it in this story in just a minute is bring division. We're going to see after the, this, this decision, the truth of this decision is brought to light. The en well, in this case, it's not the enemy, but there's a little bit of a division between Joshua and the leaders who made this decision and the people who are upset that they made the wrong decision. So that's just a simple ex example. There are so many things as we face in life. That they're important things, but it'd be very easy to just think, well, everything's fine with me and God right now, and it probably is, and, and, and I'm used to this, I've been through this before, and we think it's not that big a deal to pray about. I, I just want to emphasize to you that it's so important that we consult with God about everything of significance. I want to encourage you to ask God, God, what do you have to say about this? 
Now, I could do a whole Bible study on this. I'm just going to give it to you really quick. Why do we need to hear what God has to say? We need God's insight. Let me give you four real quick reasons you can meditate on this on your own this next week. We need God's insight because things are not always what they seem to be. That's obvious in this passage. And you've probably experienced that in your own life. We need God's insight because we often don't know everything we need to know. So we need God's insight. We need God's insight because God knows what is best. Now, if you don't believe that, you need to get to where you can believe that. God does know what's best. That's why many times when I'm praying, I'll say, God, here's what I want you to do. Here's what we all want you to do. But God, you do what you know is best because you do know what is best. And then we need God's insight because, to be honest, we can be easily deceived. Now, when I say that, there may be some of you saying, yeah, but not me. Can I tell you, you're the ones that need to really be concerned about this. And I'm not being ugly. I'm just saying, when we begin to have an attitude, and we may not even have it about every area of life, but if there's a certain area of my life where say, well, I would never fall in that area. Oh, I would never believe the enemy in that area. I would never be deceived in that area. Beware of that kind of attitude. You know, the Bible says pride comes before a fall. Now, I don't mean that we should go around with an attitude of oh no I can't make any good decisions and the devil's just going to whoop me all up down one side and down, up one side and down the other and, no I don't you need to be confident in the Lord but you need to realize that your confidence is in him and in his ability and his willingness and his desire to guide you and to lead you and to empower you okay so beware of having a you can't fool me attitude uh, some promises we can cling to. James 1, five. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Now that principle, I believe, is true for every area of life. But if you read that passage in context, it's talking about when we're going through difficulties, tests and trials and the enemy's coming against us, that is a specific time that says God will give you wisdom if you ask him. Okay? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. One of my favorite passages. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Now, let me give you one exception before we go on. We don't need to consult God about something he's already given clear and specific instruction on. In fact, consulting God on something he's already given clear and specific instruction on can be a lack of faith or an act of rebellion say what do you mean by that if there's something that and the key here is clear and specific if there's something that god has already told us is what we should do or not do to pray and ask god about it means god i'm not taking you at your word let me give you an example let's say you know you got a husband and a wife and the husband's not real happy wife's probably not real happy either and so he's grown attracted to this woman at work he's thinking about building that relationship and seeing where it'll go but he goes to church and so he decides to pray about it. God, should I have an affair? We laugh. <laughs> Who would ever pray? I guarantee you somebody has prayed that at some point. But that's what I'm talking about. Things that God has already made so clear to us. We don't need to pray about it. Okay? Uh, if we go that far, we're trying to manipulate God or trying to excuse. You know, if God's made something very, very clear and specific, we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to ask God if it's okay for us to steal something because we really need it. I mean, there's some things that God has just made that clear. Okay? And let me just add this. If you decide to go ahead and do something stupid or sinful, don't say that God told you to do it. Okay? All right. Now, let's go on. I leave that one alone. The, the fourth thing here, you say, you wonder how many there are, there's five total. The fourth one is two wrongs never make a right. Now, the old joke is two wrongs don't make a right, but two rights make an airplane. <laughs> if you didn't get that, you can think about it or ask somebody that laughed. But two wrongs don't make a right. So Joshua and the leaders made this agreement. They made this covenant with these people, and now they find out that they are not who they presented them to be. They are among the enemy. What are they going to do? Well, let's read what they did do, starting in verse 16. At the end of three days after they made the covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now, their cities were Gibeon, Shephirah, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, 
We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we've sworn to them. And the leaders said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said to them. So what were the options that Joshua and the leaders had once they discovered their deception? Well, they could have rationalized it, saying we made the best decision we could under the circumstances. They could have passed the blame. Well, it's not our fault, you know, whatever. We, you know, we're, we're probably pretty good at passing blame. They could have gone back on their word. Even though they'd sworn to have an agreement with them, they could say, well, you deceived us. You're the ones that are in the wrongs, and just wiped them out. They could have just sent them away. Just said, you deceived us. We don't want anything to do with you. Go away gone get out of here leave the country whatever but they didn't do that why didn't they because they had made this agreement in the name of the lord in other words they had involved god's name and god's reputation in their day and age and to be honest it's still true today in their culture if they would have gone back on their agreement it basically would have said that their god cannot be trusted and joshua said if we do that then god's judgment is going to be on us and it would have been because they were God's representatives and they had done this in God's name and therefore it wasn't them that had made this agreement it was actually their God that had been brought in as a party to this agreement too so they couldn't go back on their word they couldn't annihilate them they couldn't send them away but what they did do is they discovered a way to punish them they you know they said we are your servants we'll do whatever you want us to do they said okay we're going to take you up on the word up on your word and it says that they became hewers of wood and toters of water or whatever. In other words, you know, that's a big job anyway. But when you live out in the desert and you've got to find water and provide water for all these people and these animals. And later in the story, we're going to find out that they're going to do it for the place of worship and all the sacrifices that are going to go on. And they're going to need a lot of wood for the sacrifices. These people became servants. And they willingly did so. They said, it's a whole lot better than dying. And they deceived them. So, so they became servants to carry water and to carry and chop and carry wood. And we find that when you trace this through the story of God's people, they did this for, for centuries. Later, much, much later, when the temple is built under Solomon, we see that the same, the descendants, not the same group of people, the descendants of the same group are still the ones who are providing the water and the wood. But they're alive. So God honored their decision. It came out as a result of deception, but God honored it. He, and, and, and we're going to see, if you read the next chapter, you're going to find the other kings got really ticked off at the people of Gibeon because they had basically deceitfully surrendered. And so they go to attack Gibeon. And now <laughs> Joshua and the Israelites have this covenant relationship with Gibeon. So if these kings attack Gibeon, it's as if the kings are attacking them. So they have to go and defend them. But Joshua learned his lesson because it says the Lord said to Joshua go I'm going to give you victory so apparently Joshua asked him about it he learned to consult God and God did God enabled his people to have victory over all these kings that came against Gibeon the ones that had deceived them and in fact if you trace this story through the Bible you can read this later in 2 Samuel chapter 21 that much much later when King Saul is the, Saul, is the king we're hundreds and hundreds of years later. He looks back on this incident and says, oh, those Gibeonites, they deceived our people so long ago. I'm going to get back at them. And he started slaughtering the Gibeonites. God's judgment fell on Israel because King Saul did that. Because this agreement had been made in God's name and God is going to keep that agreement. Let me give you a couple thoughts here and then we'll move on to the last principle. Don't try to correct one sin by committing another. Don't try to correct, you know, two wrongs don't make it right. Don't try to cor don't cor correct one sin by committing another. We've all experienced this. C can you tell, you know, when you get caught in a lie, another one's not going to help a lot, not long term. Another example would be divorcing your spouse because you feel like you married the wrong person or for the wrong reason. Even if you did marry the wrong person for the wrong reason, the, the, the marriage was outside of God's will. Maybe you didn't even consider God. You made that commitment before God. And you're going to compound the problem by committing another sin to try to take care of that sin or that problem or that mistake, however you want to categorize it. But let me give you the flip side of that. God looks for integrity and he will reward it. 
I mean, these people deceived God's people, and they, they allowed themselves to be deceived. They made this agreement, but because they stuck to their word, they were people of integrity, God rewarded them. Psalm 15 talks about, God, what kind of person can be in right relationship with you and be in your presence? It starts out in verse 1 saying, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? And it's got this list of things that God considers very, very important things about character and integrity. And when you get to verse 4, it says, The person who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. In other words, they keep their word. They make a commitment, and maybe they didn't realize all the consequences of that commitment, but you know what? Now that they realize it, it's like, oh, I wish I could take that back. I'm not going to do it. I'm a person of my word. And God rewards that. I was going to the last, the last principle here. Trust God to bring good out of your mistakes. You know, even when we blow it, even when we make a mistake, even when we sin, when we come back to God and get it right, get it right, God can bring good out of that. It's one of the things I love about God. He never gives up on his people. He always wants to work for their good. Now, there will be consequences that'll come from the decisions we make. Sometimes there'll be very serious consequences, maybe some that are not so serious. They're still gonna be there, but God will still work in your situation to bring good out of that which the devil meant for bad. Let's finish off this story in verses 22 to 27. Joshua summoned them, the people of Gibeon, and he said to them, why did you deceive us, saying we are very far from you when you dwell among us? Now therefore you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. Trust God to bring good out of your mistakes. I'll be honest with you. This story puzzled me a little bit at first. In most cases where you see God's people ignoring God and his plans and his directives and what he wants them to do and walking in disobedience and not doing the right thing, there are always consequences, and there are consequences here. But I thought these consequences are not very big. In fact, there are very few consequences for Joshua and the Israelites. There are some consequences for the Gibeonites that actually turn out to be a blessing. They get to serve in the temple of God. But there aren't very serious consequences here. And it's like, God, there's been so many. I mean, when the whole thing happened with AI, I mean, 30-something people lost their lives and they lost the battle until they got the sin taken care of. But yet here there's not very serious consequences. Why? Why are the consequences not worse? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us deliberately, but I did some meditating. I think here's a couple ideas I came up with. These are my ideas, my thoughts, my, my opinions. I think one of the reasons the consequences were not worse is because in this case there was no deliberate sin involved. In AI there was. There was this man and it seems to in, imply his family was involved in it maybe even after the fact but he deliberately defied God's direct instructions. I mean deliberately. <laughs> Major sin. So the consequence is pretty serious. But there is no deliberate sin here. Joshua and the leaders are just trying to make a decision. I mean unless you want to consider they didn't ask God about it was a sin. I mean, that's a gray area. Is that a sin? Is that not a sin? It's not wise. But I think that's one of the reasons why there wasn't um, as bad a consequence. And plus, Joshua and the leaders were trying to do the right thing. They weren't saying, how can we defy God? But I think also the consequences ended up not being as bad as because we see here at least the beginning of these Gibeonites putting themselves in the place where they recognize that they fear this God and they need to submit to him. Now, they don't express faith like Rahab did. I mean, Rahab in Jericho, she said a lot of the same things, but she basically said, I'm putting my, myself under the authority of your God, and I'm going to you know, basically serve him. They didn't go quite that far, but they're going that direction. I think God in his mercy and grace caused the consequences not to be quite so bad because they're headed in the, the Gibeonites are headed in the right direction. But I want to give, give us a, a, a warning here. 
this is true. God can bring good out of your mistakes and he can cause the consequences sometimes to not be as bad as they could have been. But we need to be very careful not to use this as an excuse to sin or make poor choices because I think we'll bring things on ourselves that we really don't want. And that is one of the ways that Satan uses to deceive us. Well, just go ahead and do it. You know God doesn't want you to or whatever, but it's not gonna be as bad as you think it will be. See, that's all part of what the enemy's doing. Romans 8, 28, another one of my favorite passages. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. In all things, even the mistakes we made, even when we sin, not that God wants that, not that God plans for, that, uh, for us to do that, not that it makes it right to do that, but even when we blow it, when we come back to God, God can bring some good out of that. And we need to trust him for that. I came across this, uh, I wrote this statement. When you have fallen, pray to deception, pray. Two different prays. When you have fallen, pray to deception, pray. Look, we're, we're trusting God to bring good out of it. I've been deceived. I gave in to temptation, whatever. That caught me off guard. You know, that blindsided me, but it's over with now. God, I'm sorry, but here's what we can pray. God, help me to learn from it. And God, help me to recover from it. It's already done. You know, ask God to forgive you, go forward, but God, help me to learn from it. Help me to recover from it. I want to read one passage of Scripture to you, and then we're going to close. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 to 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of of sufferings. In this passage, he presents the devil like the roaring lion. <laughs> I came across this statement that says that sometimes Satan looks like that, but be warned because sometimes he appears as a cute kitten. He comes in a way that's unassuming. It's not um, dangerous, doesn't seem to be dangerous, but he slips in unawares to catch us off guard. There's a lot of practical advice in this passage. It's not one that we come to at the end of the service and the end of the sermon and say and pray and make a commitment. I mean, we can make all kinds of commitments and we should, but it's stuff that we got to live out day to day. As you go into the rest of today and into tomorrow and wherever you go tomorrow, if you go to work, if you go to school, if you, wherever you go, you got to keep your eyes open. You got to make sure you're not caught off guard to, to walk with the Lord, to talk with Him, to consult with Him about all the significant things of your life so you know how He feels about it and, you, and you're going to walk in obedience to Him so you can continue to walk in victory. And if and when you do blow it, you get it right with God and say, okay, God, help me through this. Help me to learn from this. Help me to recover from this. And, and, and Lord, just bring something good out of it. We gotta live it out day to day. But let me just tell you some of Satan's favorite deceptions. You don't need to talk to God about this, it's not that important. This sin or this thing you're thinking about, it's not that big a deal. And besides, if you carry through with it, you know God doesn't like it, God doesn't, God doesn't want you to do that. He, he calls it sin. But that's okay because it's not going to be as bad as you think. These are all ways that Satan tries to deceive us. But one of the very, very worst ones is the way he tries to deceive us before we have a relationship with God. And I only say this because there may be some of you that are here today that that is you. You are here and you're in church and that's great, but you really don't have a relationship with God. The Bible says we're all sinners separated from God, and that's why Jesus came to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. But there are people who have not responded to God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ because they're deceived. One of two things usually. One of them is you don't need a Savior. You're good enough. That's a deception from the enemy. We all need a Savior. And the second one is you need a Savior, but you're too bad. God could never love you. God could never want you. Don't even try. Those are both deceptions of the enemy. And if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with God, don't let the enemy keep you from coming to God. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today right now. And again, we've looked at your word at events that happened hmm, probably about three and a half thousand, three thousand, three and a half thousand years ago. 
but yet people were people then and people are people now and you're the same God you've always been and you still work in people's lives in the ways that you always have and we face a lot of the same temptations and we face the same enemy and he has the same tactics that he'll use on us as he used then so Lord I pray that all these things we've learned today we would put into practice in our lives so that we can walk closely with you live a life that is pleasing to you live a life of victory God, I pray for those who are here today that we talked way back at the beginning of the message that maybe they've been trying to do the right thing, but they're getting tired and they're beginning to feel like, well, maybe I should just, just shouldn't even bother because the enemy keeps just keeps after me. God, I pray that today they would leave with a confidence that you love them, you're on their side, you want to help them walk in victory. Yes, life gets difficult at times, but it's better to live for you than to walk away from you. God, I pray for those who are facing a battle right now. It's not one of the deceptive ones, but it's just an out and out in their face. I pray, dear God, that you would help them to cling to you, to do what you want them to do, and to experience victory. I pray for all those who've just recently experienced victory. We rejoice in your goodness. But God, help us to keep our eyes open, to watch out for that enemy that would come against us. I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I just want to ask, are you here today? and you do not have a relationship with God. The devil's been lying to you, saying you don't need to worry about Jesus, you're okay. Or maybe he's been telling you, you're too bad of a person, God doesn't want anything to do with you. And today, God wants you to know that he loves you, he sent Jesus to die for you, that your sins could be forgiven. And if you surrender your life to him and ask him for forgiveness, that he'll come in and establish that relationship with you. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up, because I want to pray for you. I don't have a relationship with God. I want a relationship with God. I want my sins forgiven. I need a Savior. All right. Father, again, we thank you for your word that challenges us, that encourages us, that helps us to know how we can live for you. Help us now as we leave to do that this week, to live for you and to walk in victory. Lord, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.